And I remember seeing some of the comments about like, uh, you being accused of being biased reporting within the region. No one ever asks white people whether they're biased towards white people. Like it's just a thing that we deal with, right? It's always, it's always an accusation posted against individuals from certain backgrounds because people don't like the coverage. I think a lot of us know what you do already. Mm -hmm. It'd be amazing to hear from your own words. Like, how do you, what do you, what do you, what would you, how do you like people to see what you do? Um, no one's ever asked me that question. <laughs> I think um, what we always strive to do in the stories that we tell is to show the reality of the situation on the ground and to allow people to have a platform to tell their stories in their own voices and to shed light on what's happening and hold people accountable in any way that we can. Um, and we tell real life stories. Mm. So that's, I hope, what people get from the stories that we tell, yeah. So let's take it back <coughs> to the beginning, right to the beginning. You were born where? In Iraq, yeah. And then when did you come to the UK? I went to Hull, from Iraq to Hull, yeah. Hull is like one of the right. most random places to like, yeah. as a migrant, to decide, <laughs> hey, I'm going to go. Like That's like the first question I don't want to ask. Like, how did you end up in Hull from Iraq? Um, is so your family there? No, no family at all. No connection to Hull. Um, it, yeah, it's actually a... a and the answer to that, I didn't really understand until recently. So I was born in Iraq. I was around three or four or five. The reason why there's three years that it could have been is because my dad changes the story every time he tells <laughs> it. So one day I was, you were three years old. No, you were five. Okay, it was one of those years that we, we left. We went to the UK. My dad went to study and he studied, he did his PhD in Hull. And that's how I ended up there. And that was the story I always knew. Born in Iraq, dad went to study. And it was only in recent years when I, you, the more that you speak to people, the more that you, you go out and you tell people stories and then you realize that your own parents have their, their stories to tell. Mm. And so you dig a little bit deeper. And my dad very recently told us how um, he, in Iraq, you have to, you had to be part of the army. You had to go and do two years service. But if you studied or if you, got a scholarship then you could be discharged from the army and he had managed to um he, he'd managed to get a phd a scholarship for a phd and it applied to these different places and then he had to go back to the army where he was supposed to do his service and officially discharge and whilst he was there there was it was during the iran iraq war it was in the 80s and there was a uh, shelling and one of his friends or someone he knew had been killed on the day that he went there. And he thought, he told me that he thought, I just have to go, we have to leave. I have to get my kids out of here. And he said within 10 days, he'd left Iraq and he was in Hull. So Hull was the first place that accepted him. Mm. Uh, there were a number of other places that he could have ended up at, um, but that was the first place and he took it. Um, so even though my dad went to study and even though we got to travel on a, a plane out of conflict, it was, um, he, he did it to save his family in his mind. And I got to say, are your first and like formative initial memories in Hull or do you still have some pervading memories? In very, that? very vague memories, not that many. Basically, I remember some chickens and a tricycle. Um, <laughs> and also my dad, I, I remember my dad going, me going with my dad to a mosque before we left. And I, the only reason why I remember that is because when I went back to Iraq many, many, many years later, we went to this same mosque and I was like, this is in my memory. I remember this mm. place. It was very emotional. And then my dad said, yeah, this is where I brought you just before we went to the UK. So that it's like really, really small memories um, because formative years. Of course, three years. But like, so, so like, what was life in Hull? As uh, I imagine you were the only Iraqis in Hull. No, there's a few. There okay. were a few, not not a huge amount. It's very white working class community. There were some people from Iraq who were there, and then in the later on, actually, Hull became. I think it has the largest population of Kurdish Iraqis in the whole of the United oh, Kingdom. So, but at the time when I went, it was very very white working. You obviously class. brought them all with you. Yeah, <laughs> in the years later. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it, it was. Interesting. I'm sure there are people here who have come from the north of England or have lived in very white working class communities. And I'm sure we all have the same. <laughs> you're giving me eyes like, yeah. 
Exactly. So, you know, these stories like we tell over and over again, but I feel like people relate to them so often um, that they're still worth telling. But I remember like my mum used to make me kebab sandwiches it's funny because this lunchbox imagery is actually, I've heard this a lot, like especially from Korean communities and Japanese communities about this. For example, bringing a bento box and people saying things about the smell, for example. And, and then you get older and all you want is smelly food. That's thing. all you, you want. Imagine getting a sushi box back in primary school. Now I go to work and I bring my own kebabs and I'm like, kebabs and what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was never part of my experience. Interestingly, I grew up in London. So like for me, it was um, white people were the minority, funnily enough. Um, a few of my friends have said that. The experience is... A very, very different. I like. I have friends who grew up in London who went to um, schools where there were a lot of Muslims or white people with a minority, and it's just a completely different it's experience, experience too. Entire, I mean, if someone bought like a turkey sandwich in our school, we would have given them <laughs> crap for it. Like that was insane because we had like kebab rolls, we had like paneer tikka, we had like a variety of different things. But so I guess I it, within my experience, it's very difficult to understand or relate to like feeling like the only person um, or feeling very different in those formative years like how did you feel did you feel like you were like an outsider um emotionally how did that impact you as a team well i guess i guess you you pick up skills from that which you, you know i think i'm still using skills to this day that i picked up from then we we recently with the job that we do we go into hostile environments quite a lot and we do hostile training so they teach you how to behave in certain scenarios whether it's you know uh, a bomb or an explosion or someone kidnaps you and one of the things that they talk about is code shifting so you as an individual being able to fit into multiple different environments. Um, and I feel like as a result of growing up in that community, I can shift, shift in those environments a little bit, not completely, but you can. Um, and that allows you to you access other communities or talk to other people. And, and I think that definitely had an influence. Um, but it's the same age old story, isn't it? Like identity crisis, mm. which is, you know, you are at home. My parents, you know, prayed five times a day. They were, um, they're religious. Um, and at home, I was the Iraqi Muslim girl. And then when I went to school, I just didn't want anything to do with that. I didn't want people to talk about that. And I, you know, lived a different life. So it was like these two identities that you have at school. I'm like the loud gobby one mm. who is, you know, just cracking jokes and trying to make sure no one talks about who I am or where mm. I'm from just by being loud. And then, and then you know, as it develops and you, you grow this curiosity towards who you are. Mm. And I think for a lot of people, definitely for myself, it was separating my parents' expectations as me as, a, as, a, as an Arab, as a Muslim, as an Iraqi to my own expectations to be like, actually, this is my identity and mm. I can be this person in my own way. And mm. that allowed me to kind of start understanding a little bit more of but that, who that, I am. did that come later like surely oh, that realization yeah. was like as a result of like experience and time and and life oh, much throwing later, you some yeah, yeah, sour yeah. curveballs yeah. i mean you still learn you never stop do you so 100%. i'd say i'm still learning now definitely no one's ever in a place where you exactly. go ah yeah this is it this is me i mean definitely. it'd be great if you could but but there were, were there moments like that really like were defining for your like, like spiritually how how did you identify spiritually in your teens was it something very difficult to um if your parents obviously were practicing, is it something that you felt was important to you at that time? Um, religion, to me, I've, yeah. I mean, my identity as a Muslim is a very, very important one, religiously or spiritually, or how I, um, or how I believe in God, uh, is my own business mm -hmm. and not anyone else's. But I don't mean that to you. I mean just in general. This is like my outlook. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> not you. <Yeah>. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> what I mean is like my identity is a Muslim and I think it's important for sure, us sure. from all different backgrounds, from however we engage with in terms of our religion to Definitely. be able to say I'm a Muslim and I'm proud of that and no one has the right to take away that identity from me. Mm. And that is, I've always, it's never been an issue for me in terms of um, my identity as a, a Muslim person. Spiritually, I've been on many different journeys of, you know, my own personal beliefs but I'm definitely proud of calling myself a Muslim I don't walk around in Same. this industry For and sure. say hi you know my name's Hina I'm a Muslim of course. because it's you know people then start applying um uh, stereotypes or beliefs or you know their own 
idea of what that identity is on you. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's not necessarily something I talk about very much. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, like I, I, I think I, I meant it more emotionally what it meant to you. But it's funny, like, that you t took it to a place where about perception of others from the outside to you. But like, for me, I was just curious, like, personally for you, was it important to you? Was it something that you felt was an experience that you wanted to identify with? Like, take away everybody else's perceptions of you as a Muslim, you're a teenager and you're in school. It was just something that you felt like, you know, you connected with. No. That's, that's <laughs> interesting. To I me. say, no, it was part of me. Like I celebrated Eid mm. and Ramadan mm. and I went to the mosque and I went to the mosque to learn how to read the Quran. I, I was, I also went on, I went to Arabic school on a weekend, mm. but it was something I wanted to get as far away from as sure. possible when I was at school because it was a white working class school and all I wanted to do was fit in. So actually I resented it. I yeah. resented that identity and I resented, you know, that whole thing that I had to um, do when I was at home. And I'd say it was only going through my own journey yeah, um, that I managed to reclaim the identity for myself for sure. away from whether it's, perceptions for people at school, whether it's my parents' perceptions mm. or what basically imposed on me this identity. Once I got to say, wait a minute, I get to define what exactly. it is and I get to say what it is. Then, then it was different. Then that, that became, you know, freeing. When did, when did that come? Was that like a, a recent realization? Because for me, I feel like it was a re recent realization. I like, like I said, my, my, my school context was completely different. Ironically, I grew up spiritually and culturally with a lot of people I could identify with. But I think in that context, there's a lot more opportunity for comparison. Whereas you had quite an isolating experience where your experience was your experience. There wasn't that many Iraqi female Muslim girls in your school. So like you could keep it to yourself. Whereas a lot of people in London, for example, grew up in environments where like, they're constantly being compared that you're not Pakistani in the way that these Pakistanis are, or you're not like Asian in the way these Asians are. And, and there's a lot of comparison as a result of that diversity, um, which can also be triggering in different ways. Um, and spiritually, people are compared to other people. And if you're not doing this in a certain way, then it's bad. Or um, And I feel like actually that realization for me came very recently where I gained the confidence to be like, this is how I identify with something that means a lot to me. Um, um, when did it exactly happen for you? Was it was it always a thing in your life, or no? I'd say it's it's an evolution. Mm. Um, it's definitely an evolution, and I think a lot of it came with going back to Iraq. So the first time that I went back to Iraq, I didn't. I was maybe eighteen, nineteen. Gosh. Um, and you only if you if you're diaspora and you haven't been back to the country where you were born and where your parents are from, the only thing that you know of that country is what your parents have told you, and you know. My parents being conservative, they'd be like, you know, everyone's just a really great Muslim. They're all marrying doctors over there. Everyone's just, they're just really great children. And they all do what their parents say. And <laughs> this is this is what they're like. And then... Um, they romanticize the homeland. Yeah, course, they do. Yeah. Of course they do. And then uh, the first time I went back to Iraq when I was like, I think it was 18. And I didn't, you know, I was going back to this place that my parents told me everyone was like deeply religious and how was I going to come back and what would happen? Would they just leave me there? And like all these like crazy sort, which were never going to happen, but they all go through your head. And it was like a big deal with my friends, like what's going to happen when you come back? Like you're going to be married <laughs> off. And then uh, I came back with like short ginger hair from, <laughs> because we, we, went, we went to Iraq. I met my auntie. She took me to a hairdresser. They bleached my hair blonde because they said, this is really great. This is what they love in England. Like everybody's got like blonde hair. Like this oh is the God, thing. Oh my God, that's so funny. So they put this like, they she told me she was going to give me a few highlights, takes the highlight cap off. And it's just like, I've just got white hair. I cry. She's like, why are you crying? People in England love this. And I'm like, my eyebrows are black. <laughs> and so my auntie then feels really, really like guilty. So she's like, I'm going to take you to the best hairdresser in Baghdad. She takes me to another hairdresser. They dye it red. After a time, by the time I get back to the UK, it's ginger. So I come back to the UK. My friend's like, oh, all right. So it wasn't that bad then. Okay, <laughs> fine. But um, I think it was like, those were the initial experiences that I had when I started to like understand what it was. But the first times I went back to Iraq, it was with my family. So I was still within those, like with the, within the remit of, you know, who my family are and, and seeing um, Iraq through their eyes. 
But then as I started reporting and with the news and um, advice, I went to Iraq and I've been back to Iraq multiple times and I've covered like the youth led protests mm. there. And you see this other side that exists, this entire community that exists away from your parents' visions of what your home country was. And you realize that, you know, my parents have not been to Iraq for many, many, well, they, that's a lie, they've been to Iraq many times, but they had not been to Iraq for many years. They, haven't, they hadn't lived there for many years. Um, and they don't necessarily know their home country. Right. As it's well. almost as if they like captured it within a certain time capsule. Yes. And it stops there. Like I find that the same experience with my dad was like, you know, he, my dad was born and raised in Kenya and he left at 21. And then he didn't get to go back for a very long time as a result of him working his ass off here in London. But for like 15 years, I think he, he hadn't gone back. And what happened is that Mombasa, his hometown, had become this like romantic place where like the food was incredible and everything worked and it was magical and tropical. And I grew up with this like fantasy of it being a paradise. And then when we eventually went back, it was a very different story. Um, it was a bit sad. I mean, that's really interesting. With Iraq, it was very sad because actually we went back 20 years later and it was like it was still stuck in the time warp there. Yeah. My parents had left because of the Iraq, because of... um. We went just before the Iraq war and then just after, but there'd been sanctions, years of sanctions. So the cars were the same. And um, my dad used to play this song on the raid, um, in the car, when a, a very old, famous Iraqi song. And I went, the first time I went back to Iraq, I remember being in a taxi and th that song coming on the radio. And so it was like Iraq was stuck in a time warp. So there was that, that sadness mm. to it, but you know, people of all people change and there are communities that exist beyond the communities of your parents that I have had the privilege of being able to see and that's definitely opened my eyes because it opened my eyes to, it made me realize that like, you know, there are people in every country, culture in every country, there are creatives, there are people that exist sure. outside of the boundaries that people want you to exist in and so therefore you can claim your identity however you want to yeah. claim it. So like, you know, you being a reporter, considering your background, I know you studied chemistry, which is... Yeah, Iraqi studied chemistry. Which is a whole yeah. U-turn. <laughs> Someone people did call me Chemical Ali at oh my God. the university. All right. True story. There True we are. Story. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm trying to understand is like, obviously the Iraqi experience, you know, like, oh my God, is literally thinking about it now. The Iraqi is all over my life. Literally like my sister married we an Iraqi. Get everywhere. My sister married an Iraqi. My close family friend who's like a sister married in Iraqi so I just feel like you guys are everywhere right now but I know part of the Iraqi experience is shaped by so much trauma as well obviously being like riddled with war and civil war and and and, and lots of different diff difficulties how has that shaped your identity as a person like coming from conflict conflict and it's funny that you're a conflict reporter for me is there a parallel yes, in of this course. kind of <laughs> definitely it's all linked it's like you know my memories of growing up is that my parents would have the news on. We'd be watching the what's happening with the Iran-Iraq war. We'd be watching what's happening with the Gulf War, with the, you know, with the sanctions. My parents would be on the phone talking to family members, screaming really loudly. And they still haven't figured out to this day that you don't need to shout on the phone, that technology has improved. But they're the earliest memories that I have. Like most people were watching whatever they were watching. I was watching the news constantly. And 2003 and the war in Iraq changed everything for me, I'd say. Um, that was what engaged me politically. That's what engaged me with human rights. That's what engaged me with injustice. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, I was during, during the war when the invasion on Iraq, I was involved, heavily involved in um, a lot of anti-war movements and activism. And if you focus on a particular injustice, there's no way that you don't start noticing other injustices. Sure. And that's how, you know, it can expand your mind like that. So you, if you take a particular interest, how can I care about what's happened in Iraq and foreign policy and not care about foreign policy elsewhere? Absolutely. And so, yeah, I, I studied chemistry. I went to university and I studied science like everybody else in my family did. I, my two do sisters are doctors, my brother's a dentist, my other brother studied um, computer science. So it was like standard, you're gonna, you're gonna study chemistry or you're going to study I mean I studied chemistry it's kind of frowned upon in my family but like at least it was medicinal chemistry my dad was like at least it has medicine in the title yeah. it's fine. <laughs> um, and then but I knew when I was at uni I was like this is not it for me I cannot do this this is not what mm. what I'm going to do and yeah I was contemplating different things that I could do and 
I was in, involved in the student paper and I wrote a lot and I was involved in that. So I was like, journalism, I think that's what I'm going to do. And obviously, my parents hated the idea. <laughs> and um, Why? Because uh, they come from a background where your career is supposed to provide you with stability and an income and also status. Mm. And medicine provides you with stability and status. Uh, and journalism um, coming from the background that I come from doesn't necessarily do that. It requires you to have an un be in an unstable environment and job that requires you to travel alone as a woman. That's not great, you know. And so actually, originally, I think when I told my parents like I wanted to do journalism, they didn't take it seriously. But I was like dead set. This is what I'm going to do. Mm. I'm going to be a journalist. And I, I went back to them and I said, I'm applying for this master's degree and I want to do broadcast journalism. I'm going to, this is what I want to do. And they said no. And I was convinced that I, I would be able to change their minds. I'm going to, it's fine. They'll just see, I'll get into this master's and they'll change their minds. Um, and master's cost money, like it's thousands of pounds. And so I applied for absolutely every scholarship that I could apply or find. And luckily the National Union of Journalists, they said, um, we're going to invite you for an interview for a scholarship so I go down to London and my parents don't know this they think I'm just heading out for the day but I've gone down to do this interview and um, I remember being sat going into the offices and there was a panel of people who were interviewing me mm. and they're asking different questions about why you want to do this and, and all, all of that and this one lovely lovely lady white lady thought she came up with a really good question she said but you know, you studied chemistry, now you want to do journalism, who's to say that you're not going to change your mind tomorrow? And, um, and I, was, I just said, well, my parents are Arabs and they forced me to do chemistry, so it wasn't really my choice. And now I, you know, I'm finally getting to choose what I want to do. And so this is what I want to do. And there were, I think it was like, there was a there was a black man on the panel, and I, th I want to say Southeast Asian, um, but there was somebody else on the panel, and they were just nodding like this. <laughs> like, we, yeah, don't, it's fine, don't worry, it's fine. And uh, they actually gave me, I remember walking out of that interview and just bursting out crying because mm -hmm. everything was like resting on this. I needed, I really needed this. I didn't know where else I was going to get the money from. Mm -hmm. and, and they gave me it, the National Union of Journalists after that. They gave me the scholarship. And I went back to my parents and I was like, guess what? I got into the masters and I got a scholarship. And they were still like, yeah, no. Oh, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. So it took a lot of convincing. It took many, many years. And how did you eventually like bring them to your side? Bring them to my side. Did they ever, yeah. Did you just I have go to say, so I have to say upfront, first of all, like I love my parents. Oh good, yeah, so my I'm glad parents, you that. My parents, like, Whatever experiences I had, my parents' experiences are way beyond. Like, I have the privilege of talking about mental health. I have the privilege of, like, understanding who I am and these freedoms that they never experienced. They don't even have the privilege of talking about how mental health impacts them. And, you know, my dad has supported me. He was supporting me financially when I was at university. He's guided me with opinions. He's challenged me on a lot of things that I appreciate before I go into these like anecdotes, I appreciate what my parents do um, and what they have done for me, but it took them a long time to, to get on board. And I think, I think um, when I was, I used to work at Sky News and uh, I know, controversial. <laughs> no, actually Sky News was a wonderful place to learn. Uh, it was a brilliant place to learn. And I learned a hell of a lot from them and I definitely wouldn't be here if I didn't have that opportunity at Sky. But, um, yeah, uh, my dad saw me on TV for the first time. Mm -hmm. I think someone was like, I think that was Hind on the <laughs> TV reporting. It's probably reporting on like, I don't know. At the time I was doing a lot of Cat Up the Tree. But I think when he saw me, he was like, oh, okay. So she wasn't lying about this. There's something here. Maybe. But um, even to this day, I remember I went to a wedding, uh, an Iraqi wedding, and there were, we were sat at this table and there was this... Uh, really lovely Iraqi lady and she said oh your parents must be so proud of you and I said well my dad's here you can ask him <laughs> and my dad was like what and I was like she just said you must be so proud of me dad and he was like yeah, I mean. <laughs> very Larry David <laughs> and he went it's very tough it's tough it's a tough job and he still calls me up occasionally he's like 
Did you know that the BBC has science correspondent? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, it's been 14 years, please. Um, so he's so still yeah. not entirely on your side. Like in, you know, in his ideal world, you know, yes, I would be um, a doctor. Uh, but, you know, my sisters I mean, are doctors and still complaining. I mean, but. any father <laughs> would probably prefer their daughter to be yeah. not on the front lines of some of the world's worst crises in the world but somewhere safe and secure. You say that they, it's not the danger that worries them. <laughs> and oh, that's not it. It's the prestige. You know, he's not going, oh, be, yeah. It's, no, I think, I think it's just stability, isn't it? That's what they're searching for. They're always right. searching for a level of stability for you. Um, and so, like, this is different to them. And, and I have to say, like, I, I know I, I said before, like, I, they did help me a lot. They did help me a lot. You know, my dad... When the first time I traveled for work, somebody called him up and they said, uh, they said to him, like, which, which means, do you not have bread on the table that your daughter has to go out to, to work? And my dad, my dad called me up and he told me that and he was like, just ignore it. Just get on, just keep doing yeah. it what can you do there's always going to be people who say that and like you know that so my dad said that to me so regardless of all these things that happened there are these like really important moments in my life that they stuck by me and they they helped me through it so i think i think arab, especially arab dads like have a particular way of showing their approval and their love in a given moment it might not be like exactly pat you on the shoulder and be like habibzi i'm proud of you but it's like moments like that which just show a deep-rooted support of what you do and a pride almost i think like d- you know, was there a moment where you also started to empathize with how your parents might be feeling as people who fl- fled in Iraq oh my God, was in yeah. turmoil? Absolutely. And like, because I, I, I know for a lot of us as children of immigrants, like part of the reconciliation, it's funny, you grow up, I remember, you know, for me particularly growing up, the moment I started to see my parents as just, just like me. They weren't these like idealized people who never put a foot wrong. They were humans also. They were kids. Isn't that a crazy moment? It's crazy. It's insane. I actually remember Isn't it a moment. crazy moment? Do you? When was it? It was with my mother. Let's interview you. So my mother. <laughs> I need like a footstool. And like a <laughs> no, but I actually remember the moment. I, my mother's not here today. Thank God. So I can actually <laughs> say it. But this will be blasted all over the internet. So she will probably see it. But I remember this moment where we were in a petrol station. Iliot, my sister's here though. My sister was young. <laughs> oh, she was filming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My sister was young. Yeah. And, oh, you filming? You filming it? No, no, no. Welcome oh, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We were we had a pe- we were at a petrol station, <laughs> and um, we can always cut it out after, can't we? No, but we were at a petrol station, and my uh, my sister had gone in. There were a group of four or five girls who had gone in, and they were just being like high school kids, bratty, a bit kind of boisterous and juvenile. And um, I think they said something to Ilya or they, or, or, or they were being a bit rude. They were rude to my sister. I was in the car, so I hadn't seen anything. But then Ilya must have come out and told my mother. And then my mother goes in and starts like confronting them. My mom's like a Wilson girl. <laughs> so my mom doesn't take any of it. So I was like, blah, blah, blah. Did you say something to my daughter? Rare, rare, rare. Like going out on them. And I'm just seeing silence. But in the window, I'm seeing my mom go. go. <laughs> and these kids going... <laughs> and I'm wondering what's happened. My mom comes back and she's shouting and she gets back in the car, puts the car on, drives off really fast and then like flicks them off. Your mom flicks them off. And I'm like, <laughs> what just happened? What just happened? And for me, it was a moment where like, that wasn't my mother in front of me. Yeah, but you <laughs> that realize that your girl. mom was like but it, badass. It, it sounds crazy, exactly. But it was a very humanizing moment in the sense that my mom literally two minutes later realized it was not the right thing to do. And like, um, she felt guilty in was that moment. <laughs> there was a better way to do that in front of her children. Sure, anyway. sure, sure, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> but she, um, but, but I think that moment was really important because they stopped being like these people on a pedestal, but real people with emotions and feelings. And I think with people, especially within the Iraqi experience of people having fled things that have been particularly traumatic, there must've been a moment where you started to deeply empathize. Like, look, your dad just wants the best for you given in the context of everything you've gone through. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say the, the humanizing bit is one thing. The realizing that your parents want um, the best for you is another thing. So I think like I, we, you go through stages. So yeah, there were, there were moments when I would debate with my dad and I would just deeply disagree with what he was saying. And when you realize that there's a moment where your parents could be wrong, like their opinion yeah, exactly. is not necessarily absolutely right mm-hmm. and what they're saying is 
a result of their own experiences or what you know th their own interpretations mm -hmm. of things and it was okay for you to disagree and say actually i think you know i think you're wrong but then you know i people's experiences with their parents my experience with my parents i'd say first of all like initially it's growing up it's resentment like you just want to break free you just want to be able to get away from their control of you and then once you get a little bit of that freedom it's guilt of mm -hmm. like oh i've not done what my parents really wanted me to do and cultural guilt and then you get to a, a stage where it's actually it's you start believing yourself and and you know you you kind of pointing fingers at your parents yeah, like yeah. why did you do this and then you get to a point where i think it's full circle and you yeah. you can you can be like okay you made those decisions like yeah. you had a different life to me like what you experienced was what my parents experienced was way harder than anything i've experienced so sure. how can i how can i put my opinions based on growing up here on, and absolutely say that my parents should do that but i like your story about what your mum did Growing up, so my mum wears a hijab. Mm. And growing up in a white working class community with a hijab on, that's tough. And I remember when I was younger, I was embarrassed to walk with my mum, mm. like in town, because people might see me from school and they'd get, you'd get called more racist comments mm. or people would like say things to you. And then, you know, you get older and you're like, like of course not. And now when I think back about uh, uh, my mum, my mum used to wear, like, you know, like um, in Iraq, they have like, we have abayas, we have mm -hmm. these like black cloaks. We used to go to the beach in summer. My dad used to take us to the beach, it's like day out, drive like an hour and a half up the coast. And my mum, everyone's wearing bikinis on the beach. My mum's wearing an abaya. And she, I'm pretty sure she did it to troll everyone <laughs> on the beach. She would just stroll through the I beach in her black abaya. And that I'd be like, Oh, mom's like, yeah, again. That is so badass. And though. now I think back, I'm like, damn. Damn right. Look, yeah, she literally did give a, like, in an environment, like, everyone's different. There's like things I look back on and go, you know, that's so badass what you did then. You did not give a shit. And it was like, you know, this is during the 90s or this is not the place that we're living in now. Like it's a different time up north and they were doing that. So there's a lot of things that I think back at, you know, my dad had a, my dad came to study, came to, to do a PhD mm. and um, gave up everything for us. And he worked, you know, in corner shops. And mm. there was also, like my dad was on Crime Watch, remember that? Yeah. He wasn't the criminal, <laughs> <laughs> just saying that. <laughs> but he worked, he worked like in a corner shop and this guy came in with a gun and my dad being Iraqi was like, nah, you're not, you know, getting this money, I'm gonna wrestle <laughs> you. And he wrestles him and the oh gun goes God, off. Know this. And he's all on crime watch. Like, ah, my dad did that. I'm like, where is this video? If anyone that is so was ever involved crazy. in crime watch in the 90s, please, can you get us that video? But yeah, so like, you know, there were these really crazy things that my parents like did that now I think back on it, I'm like, oh, like, wow. Yeah. You were actually amazing people. No, parents are amazing, mashallah. Like, one thing I wanted to speak about was the kind of moment for you that your career suddenly crystallized into this trajectory this zone that you were in what is there like a defining moment where or an opportunity that you had that like changed everything maybe it was a person that gave you a prop up or it was a, a job that like propelled you into an environment that allowed you to shine like what was that moment i'd say working in media is like a mixture of hard hard work graft and then occasional luck that can like lead you to the place that mm. you're in um i once once I started my course, I did my master's and then I applied for different places and I ended up um, getting work at Al Jazeera and working at, at Sky News. And uh, as I mentioned, I, I learned a lot from Sky, but I remember like Sky, as much as it taught me a lot how to produce, um, you know, how to be on camera, how to put stories together and, and all that sort of thing, it was, it was a difficult environment um, to work in because I think I was like reporting quite a lot on domestic stuff and I really, really, really wanted to do international stuff. Um, and actually I didn't, I, I left Sky um, because I, because of various things that happened. Um, and I ended up within, just completely by chance, I'd met somebody in, from Al Jazeera in Doha and they had got in contact with me and they had said to me that you should um, vice or um, launching a new show, like you should get in contact with them. And um, I contacted them and did some screen tests and then started off there right at the beginning. And that was like 2016. And within a month of being there, there was 
um, a lot going on in Iraq uh, at the time. And the, remember, I think at that particular time, yeah, it was 2016, the um, Iraqi army was going in into Mosul. Like Mosul was under the occupation of ISIS, so we're going in. And I just said to my bosses, I put my hand up, I said, I'm from Iraq, I speak the language, send me. And they said, yeah. And they sent me. I know that sounds like really simple. Um, there were a lot of years. It was like, you know, there were there were a whole eight years before that of working to get into a position where I could, uh, you know, put my hand up and ask for that. But I think with Vice, what was so different is they, they said, okay, we see that and we're going to give you a chance. And like, we're going to give you an opportunity to go and do this. And in some other places, it's very hard to get the opportunity because there are so many people in front of you and because, you know, like why you mm. oh yeah you speak you say you speak arabic but so what mm. um and it's a very competitive environment and you've got to be in with the right person or the right boss or whatever or you've just got to wait your turn there's a lot of talented like journalists who are there who are way ahead of you mm. um so i definitely say that i i got lucky at that moment that there was there were people who said yeah we'll give you a go let's so, see so you get given this opportunity and you're on the front lines What's going through your head? Is it imposter syndrome? What am I doing here? How do I behave in this environment? I'm presuming there was a lot of training and preparation to be in environments like that. But, you know, being in the country of your heritage during another calamity, but also reporting on it, how are you emotionally feeling? How are you dealing with that context? Um, the first time. The first, the first time I went to Iraq. Okay. The first time I went to Iraq, I actually went and reported from um, various refugee camps, uh, IDP camps, the internally displaced people. Uh, that's, that's what I was initially reporting on. And I've done so many conflict stories, frontline stories, report from Ukraine, um, you know, or in Iraq or different places. And there is still this belief, like people kind of romanticize frontline stuff and conflict and, you know, being there and getting bombed or getting shelled and like, oh, that means that you're so brave. And that's like really important journalism, actually reporting on the people who've been displaced, reporting on refugees, reporting on families that have been broken up to me is just as important mm. and I've said this before but like there is in news you know people refer to things as hard news or soft news and uh, refugees stories are seen as like soft news it is not I think it's so important and actually that was like the thing like it's definitely the thing that moves me the most every time I've been to Iraq the first time I went and I'd speak to a mother who's lost somebody who's been through something and she talks like my mum you know she's mm -hmm. got the same accent as my mum and they always say to you like they always say to you like binti, mm -hmm. binti, like you're like my daughter when they talk to you because they hear like my in mm -hmm. my accent like I'm Iraqi as well and there's like just a deep emotional connection that you can have but, but the, then there's also a feeling of responsibility like I need to make exactly. sure that you're represented and that I'm not just coming here like exactly. and asking you a few questions so I can get it out on camera and then piss off and like never right. talk to you again which happens in journalism you know Wait, wait that, that was exactly the point I wanted to do next was like does that connection compromise you in, in those environments? Like, does it give you a like a personal bias to how you report in a given situation? Um, how do you, I, I remember seeing some stuff online about your reporting in, in Palestine, for example. And I remember seeing some of the comments about like uh, you being accused of being biased reporting within the region. Um, how do you navigate that in places in which you have a personal connection with or people seeing your reporting as... No one ever asks white people whether they're biased towards white people. I'm not saying like this is like it's just a thing that we deal with, right? Yeah. Like no one ever, it's always, it's always an accusation posted against individuals from certain backgrounds because people don't like the coverage. That's what it is. Um, the point itself is biased, is what I think. I remember when I was at Sky News and I was doing a live desk chat about Syrian refugees and someone tweeted at me too close to home should not him should not be reporting on Syrian refugees too close to home I'm not Syrian I'm not a refugee mm. like what <laughs> and usually I don't respond to these things but I responded back like when was the last time um you know an Australian was told that they can't report on something that's happening in Australia or a white person is told that 
they can't report on whatever this issue is. Like, it's only something that we get. The stories that we do, it's not me out there reporting by myself. There's a huge, massive, massive team that we work with. There are lots of different people from different backgrounds. That's why the reports, that's why I believe in the reports. That's why I think the reports um, resonate with so many people. Like, Battle for Jerusalem, um, just had a whole wealth of people working on that. I'm, it's not just me. I'm not sure. just, I might be on camera, but there's Lema Al Aryan is an American Palestinian producer who like is incredible. And she worked on that and she has incredible insight and knowledge. Mm. We had Israelis who were mm. working on that report. We had Palestinians from Jerusalem, Eamon, mm. who worked on that report, Oren, DOPs from like South Africa, British, who worked on that report. We have lawyers who go through our scripts and they say like, have you, what's the source for this? What are you doing? These reports are not biased. These reports tell the reality on the ground. And the fact that we have to deal with people saying, oh, you're biased, that's, it's just- yeah, it's so horrible. But like, I'm also trying to get like, part of me feels like there is no such thing as objective reporting. It's all subjective because we're all coming from a pers right. like a, an angle. So for me, like I actually think your perspective is actually more nuanced and needed in those given environments because you're able to see things that people will probably miss. Right, yeah. So. Another thing, I think what you're saying is actually super, super important. In journalism, a lot of people think that unbiased reporting means you have to either give equal weight to everybody, which is bizarre and no one ever does that, um, or you have to come at it from a centrist political position. Now, political centrism is a really, really strong political position. Like, that's not neutrality right. to be... A centrist or to be like actually you know we, we we're not we're not we're going to report on this like not from the far right not from the far left um and this this is how we're going to report on it like, no i think the reality is that what is what is the work that we do all about the stories that we do advice all about it's about telling people's stories it's about um allowing people to have a platform allowing people to to say what they have to say and that means that you're speaking to sometimes the most vulnerable people in society and if you don't empathize with them if you don't understand or if you don't try and understand from where they're coming from how can you ever tell the stories how can you ever allow people to tell those stories and yeah I think it's a complete I think it's like bullshit where people say like as journalists you have to come at it from like this center point or complete neutrality. Nobody does that. What you should do is allow people to tell their stories and hold those people with power or those, it's about imbalances of power. People Definitely. hold people to power, uh, hold them accountable and allow other people to tell their stories. Absolutely. And like one of the things I love about you Hind is just like, we really feel that. I feel like I'm, like I'm seeing it through your eyes is how I see it through your work. And I think it's um, it makes such a difference for me to be able to connect with current affairs when I feel like someone who understands the experiences that we all come through are, is there and like feeling it, like we're feeling it, um, as opposed to someone who's kind of has a detachment to it. So ironically, like it, it brings me back to this question of representation and how it's not enough, right? What we need is perspective and like people from that experience actually having a subjective opinion about what's happening in front of them. Um, well, representation is key. Yeah. And I think I've said this over and over and over again, and I'll keep saying it, but media, journalism, is an elite, elitist industry. It has a disproportionate number of people from private school backgrounds who work in it. If you have that, how can you represent people? Mm. We're going through a cost of living crisis. We, people can't pay for their electricity. People can't put food on the table. People are losing their jobs. And yet you have a disproportionate amount of people that come from private school backgrounds. How, mm. how is that reflective? How are you going to reflect the mood of the nation or the experiences of people? Like that's not to say that there aren't brilliant journalists. Of course there are, there are incredible journalists. And you can, you can try and understand and tell the stories and there will be people who can tell those stories very well. Mm. But it is important, I think, for journalism to to become more diverse. We talk a lot about race, we talk a lot about gender, but intersectionality as we know is so important. You cannot talk about brown representation on camera without talking about class. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we talk about class enough and there has not been a class reckoning and we need one. Yeah, see I think for me like, I, I totally agree with you 100%, but I'm also like on the next layer of that for me is like, sometimes actually you can have brown and black people in these spaces and doing even more damage, right? So it's not only about representation, but the next layer is like, rooted perspective of people who have 
quality things to say like the reason why we love you here is because like when you're in these environments you're taking away you're extracting meaningful things that we all resonate with so for like for me there's no point if like i mean like we have a brown prime minister right and like people <laughs> recently someone came up to me or messaged me and said to me uh, you have a face like british prime minister the indian prime minister oh. and what i did was you say? so offended i was literally so offended i've never been so offended <laughs> in my life but like this person couldn't be less relatable to me but people are associating me with this with this guy as a result of his brownness but it made me realize that like having a brown prime minister doesn't doesn't mean i necessarily feel seen well or he's also like the richest prime minister that For we've sure. ever had so so it's also about perspective and people with like meaningful things to say that resonate with people on the ground and that's why we appreciate you so much like i really feel like you get deeply into it and one of the things i really wanted to know was like of course you have emotional attachments to this place but like i think that's why that's why you're so amazing at what you do but how do you not take that home how do you like how do you find spaces to kind of emotionally protect yourself from situations that are really traumatic cataclysmic um and and you know in your environments where people have really lost everything and how do you protect yourself in that environment i don't know <laughs> I really don't know. It's not something, it's a question that we get asked quite a lot. And I don't know, I'm still on that journey, still figuring it out. Um, when you go and report from these places, uh, there's, it, it, it can be very emotional. Like I have cried in like interviewing people. There's no way you can go and we went to Gaza and we spoke to um, this man who'd been pulled out of the rubble when Israel had bombed Gaza last year and he lost 22 members of his family and he re he reeled them off one by one. I was bawling on the other side, like the whole team was. It, it really impacts you. Of course, that's not the story, so we're not showing that. You don't see what's happening behind the camera. You don't know how it's impacting people. And like, that's just one, every time, you know, I, I remember going to Iraq and we were, we interviewed this mother who had, her son had been killed, so the, um, Iraqi security forces had been shooting at uh, young protesters, pro-democracy protesters, and her son had been hit with a tear gas canister. They were doing this on purpose. Mm. They were shooting them in the head. And he had been hit in the head and he died as a result of that. She was crying for her son. Like, how can you not cry right. with them? Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't have like a way. I'm not going to sit here and be like, this is what we do to protect ourselves. I don't know. We... To, we, we most of the time walk away with guilt like I get to go back and I get to sit in spaces like this and eat great food and like hang out with you guys and mm. like it it feels a bit wrong to come back and start focusing on you know like your grief as a result of their grief when it's so much more mm. it's not to say that that's the right way um but does it have an impact on your personal life and like you know your relationships around you your family like some people really take this stuff home with them and like it can be difficult to purge these things that you've seen throughout the course of your work. I'd say like it definitely impacts you because it impacts how you interact with things and like how you view the world and um Yeah, I mean that 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 is sorry to interrupt, but like you've literally seen systemically and we have to we're running out of time, but we you've seen systemically the worst of what the world has to offer. You've seen the product of you know, um, countries and regions which are still reaping on and suffering from ages of colonialism. You've seen um, geopolitics and the wars that they cause. You've been on the front lines of that suffering, migration, refugees. How has this shaped your personal pers perspective on life in general, spirituality, politics? Like, you've seen some of the worst that the world has to offer. And how has that shaped how you think about the world around you? Well, I think, I think, it cemented the idea that no matter where you go, it's always the poorest and the most vulnerable who suffer the most. And so for me, it's always, that's like, I like to remind myself over and over again that that is the most important thing, is representation of those voices. Um, you know, where it, it does impact you, it impacts the way that you see things, absolutely. And you know, there, there were times, I think there was, one time I remember when I came back from when I came back from Iraq reporting on those protests and I went to a spin class with a friend. <laughs> it was literally the day after I arrived back and she was like From the front lines of the spin class. Yes. Right. So <laughs> we literally been so the protests were taking place. We were in this like medical tent and there were young men who were being brought in with bird pellets, had been shot by bird pellets, you know, because that's what they were using against them at that particular time. And it was 
incredibly distressed. They were like young. We met incredible people, these young men, and they were they were fighting for something. And then I, I left, and then my friend was like, let's go spin. And I'm like, okay, sure. And so we go to spin, <laughs> and it's like loud. Yeah. And there's this like woman who's just like, you, you all been to spin? Yeah, of course, I love yeah, it. I'm you've all been to spin. Yeah, yeah, you're all crazy people. <laughs> yeah, it's like... It was loud and it was intense and it felt really surreal. Like, what am I doing here? Yesterday I was just in Iraq. And then I remember like I went into the changing room and like, I think I had a little bit of a breakdown. I didn't know why. I was like, I didn't know what was up. I was like, I don't know why I'm feeling like this. And then I just like got out and then carried on. And like, it, you know, there's those moments because I think most of us who work in journalism, we just try and push it to the back of the head and go, we just got to do the story. We mm. just got to get on with it. But really there's no way that it can't impact you. There's no way that you can see these things. Mm. And so most of us like, um, like I run now, I do a lot of running as well. And it's just ex any way to get it out yeah. basically. But it's, a, it's definitely an evolution. It's definitely something that I'm like still trying to come to terms with now or like absolutely. explore it. So many of us here are storytellers in different mediums. You obviously journalism, we've got some people here who are videographers, musicians, stylists, creatives, painters. A lot of their kind of prerogative is like to tell the story. Um, I know for myself as a filmmaker, I'm always obsessed with the story. Can my obsession with the story sometimes force me to exploit the moment? You are in situations where you have to meet people who have lost everything. Do you find sometimes you are being exploitative of a situation for the sake of the story? Um, do you? I know like once I was doing a film in Lebanon and they were, uh, they were in um, basically at a refugee camp and I've almost felt guilty for showing what I was showing because I felt like I needed certain shots and a certain story and I felt a conflict between my objectives and my morals. Do you ever feel conflicted doing the work that you do? Yeah, like there's no way you can't not, you're, you're putting a camera, excuse me, uh, you're putting a camera in people's faces sometimes at the most difficult moment. Um, there's there's a lot of conflicts you know for example another another point of conflict is awards just the fact that awards are given for for journalism you know you 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 get up and you receive this award at a fancy place and it's because you film someone who is who's struggling in one of the most difficult moments in their life it's important to you because you want to be able to keep making those films and you want to um be acknowledged by your peers and you want to be able to be given a platform so therefore these awards mean and it's like this this cycle but you're definitely aware of it the, the thing that you can do and the thing that we try and do is we try and respect people's um what they want to say we want to give them a space we explain what we're doing we we really try and allow them to have their say and understand what it is that they're taking part in um and you know we don't there's been a number of occasions where we've interviewed people and the camera's off and they still want to speak and they still want to talk and mm. we will we'll just try and be as human as possible in those moments and, um, you know, f form those, like, genuine relationships. But absolutely, like, it's it definitely is something. Mm. And if you're not thinking about it and if you're not questioning your own morals or how you're dealing with things, then, then you're wrong. You yeah, should be doing space. that because, of course, you'll find yourself in those situations. So as a storyteller, and to bring this slowly to a close as a storyteller um, all of us are looking for that golden snitch a lot of us have like objectives of our own maybe it's our experience maybe it's like highlighting a refugee crisis but for you as a master of storytelling like what a master yeah like girl you win an emmy no way <laughs> you get these awards you're definitely a master what is the equation to the best story like what makes something so compelling that it forces people to feel really like moved by what they've seen on one of your stories um because you are reporting in places which need to be highlighted which need the attention so from your experience how do you craft a story that makes sure people are connecting emotionally with the scene that you find yourself in okay um first of all i i know i said this earlier but i have to say it again like I work with massive teams mm. and there are lots of incredibly talented people that I work with. And, and I think one of the biggest keys to telling a really great story is having an amazing team that you connect with and that you work with very well and mm. you have the same vision. And I would actually, no one asked for this advice. But I'm going to give this advice anyway, if you want to, um, you know, survive 
in in media or if you want to survive in journalism find your allies find the people that you can work with find somebody who gets you or you know thinks the same way as you because it can be an alienating industry if you don't have that and when you find your people um like I have like I have so many amazing people that I work with then then making telling those stories come a lot easier because you have similar visions um in terms of like storytelling when when we when you do an interview, when we do an interview, for example, I'll never have an idea in my head of what I want them to say. That's, I mean, of course you go into interviews, I'm gonna ask them this, I'm gonna ask them this, I'm gonna ask them this. But when you go in the edit, listen to what they're saying and what you feel is the most emotive part, put that in, that's the story. Mm. The story is not the idea that you had in your head of what they should be saying. It's about the bit that moves you the most in that. And in terms of like following your nose on the story, it's whatever it is that you're interested in, go to the heart of it, go right right into the depth, go into the fire, whatever it is inside that story, track that down and find it and then try and like reflect that on camera as best as you can. Beautiful. Last but not least, there is actually a journalist here today who uh, is very young in her early 20s, who actually starts at Sky News recently. So there's a very like parallel story happening there. Who's that? I'm not going to say who, <laughs> but what I am going to say is it's a very interesting parallel story almost happening, repeating itself, similar background to you. If you could go back and tell that person something that might help her in her career, what would you say to her? Find your allies. <laughs> I just said it. <laughs> Definitely find people who you can shit talk to. Find people who you can say, did you see that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why did they do that? Find people who can be like, what about this idea? Like, is this a good idea? We should like, what about doing something from this angle? It was the biggest revelation to me. And it, it took a long time to find people like that. Um, it took the right place. But, you know, there were, there were, I'm not going to say where like this happened, but like in terms of experiences as somebody from, I'm sure everyone has their own experiences, right? In, in whatever industries you've all worked in, you've all had that moment where somebody said something that's inappropriate to you or has said something about you and the way you look or who you are or your religion. I've had moments in journalism and not saying any specific places where this is, where somebody once said to me, um, when you get married, are you going to have to... <laughs> And I was like, you what? <laughs> and when you get married, you're gonna have to, you know. And I was like, she didn't have a northern accent. I don't know why I'm doing that. But she, I was like, I but was also, like, if people listening to this have no idea what you just did. Right. So. Just, <laughs> all right. So, so she's there's a woman waving, her waving her hand across her face, like just <laughs> waving a hand across her face. And I was like, are you asking me whether I'm going to wear a niqab if I get married? She was like, yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> like why did that come like no yeah. that was just one somebody one, I once said to them my parents are conservative but not the and they finish off the sentence the violent kind <laughs> uh, you know I've had like somebody mistake Pakistani people for North African people when I pointed out that they're not the same they've said well you know them type so like those <laughs> those things have happened like and those things when you hear those things from people who are your peers or yeah, who yeah, like yeah. are supposed to understand right. better and like and again I know I keep doing this but there are also wonderful beautiful people who are really fantastic and really great at journalism but when you hear that like it can be disheartening and you can be like I'm in the wrong place like I'm in the wrong job I can't do this this is really 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 fucking hard and then you find those little rays of light and sure. those people that get it get you that will work with you that you know you don't even need to have the conversation you can look you like it's it's amazing it's a whole it's a whole new world it's like you know you gathering people in this room and like-minded people or who all have different experiences but you can like support each other and you know clap for each other like you got to find that in every single workplace that you have so what's next to you what's the world takeover what's the plan game plan how do we get involved <laughs> There's so many questions, what? <laughs> What's next for me? Uh, I, at the moment, like we've got, um, there's, there's a lot of projects in the line that we're working on. There is going to be a big Palestine documentary coming out next year. So uh, that is oh, something- Also soft topics then, good. Just, you know, something <laughs> like- controversial We're actually like, I don't know, the, a week, ago, a couple of weeks ago, we were in a bank raid, um, like for 16 hours. Oh my hours. goodness. That was like hot, like watching it. I think I watched it live. Oh, did you? <laughs> Wait, were you accidentally there? 
it's a long you watch the report <laughs> no basically the the people who were carrying out the armed bank raid with molotov cocktails for people who don't know there was a in in beirut you can in lebanon sorry you can only withdraw a certain amount of your money out so if you have like family members who are dying of cancer you can't withdraw money from the bank in order to go and pay the hospital because hospitals aren't free and so what people have been doing in lebanon is taking guns and holding up banks to get their own savings their own money Crazy. we met it happened quite a lot it's happened a few times and we met a group of people who were saying that they wanted to get hold of their money for different reasons, various reasons. And we stayed in contact with them um, and then watched the report and it'll explain the next few bits. And we somehow end up inside this bank raid, this armed bank raid. Um, we were blockaded in for 16 hours with uh, people who worked in the bank with um, and a few, a few other people. And then, um, yeah, and it unfolds and the whole story unfolds. And so that's coming out next week. So we're currently in the middle of that edit. Um, exciting, super exciting. It was I'm crazy, yeah. It was definitely one of the most surreal, the most surreal one of them. I felt like I was there. It was terrifying. You guys have to watch it. Sadly, I have to end it there because I really want to give an opportunity for at least a few questions because okay. I show some people are really dying. But firstly, I want to thank you for an incredibly educational, inspiring um, sharing of your experiences. I don't think you thank realize you actually me. she's incredibly humble and like actually plays down how much of an influence I think she has. But really, like you've inspired a generation of journalists. Like when I announced that it would be you, the amount of young people who felt really like excited and and um, they couldn't wait for the opportunity to hear from you. That's so I so think kind. thank you for your work you. and um, and hopefully you continue representing us in some of the worst environments in the world and making us feel like we're there and sharing with you. So big hand for him. Thank you so much. Thank you.